I'll have to find out because it won't open anybody's now. It just sits there and it goes in your back to the normal screen. So I'll, I'll have to call them and the color TV. It's not putting your grades in, it's getting access to your grade setting. And what happens to those of you that added the date, you can check your old app and display final grade. So is this my Yeah, you're the last one out the better feel. Oh, you got everybody else. Or I don't know what happened. I don't know if it's a temporary thing, but it works my I'll keep trying. Okay, before we move on to pulmonary ventilation, I wanted to. <laughs> Anybody know what this is? This is a what are you looking at? Yeah. You're looking at four points. What? Four points. Four points. Shall we four or by the day of our next lab exam, which is respiratory and urinary system, I want to have, I don't have to have a picture like this person said, but I want to have some type of notice from you that you have placed in your vehicle of choice an emergency kit that consists of plastic wrap and some tape. Anybody have any idea what for? Can't the backpack? <laughs> <laughs> well, the tape wouldn't help for that, but the plastic bag might. Uh, it's, it's actually the plastic bag is not there. The plastic bag is holding some uh, plastic wrap, like saran wrap. So if somebody is, now this only works for an external injury that is perforated the pleural cavity. All right, if it's a closed injury, I, this isn't going to create a chest tube. I'm not asking you to create a chest tube, okay? But if you come across somebody or yourself who's been in a traumatic accident such that there's an external opening to your lungs, and this can be indicated by frothy, bloody, so every time they breathe, it bubbles, all right? Um, and it's uh, bloody because the skin is torn. So every time they breathe in, like we talked about, they're going to be creating lower pressure than atmospheric pressure and atmospheric pressure is going to push air into their pleural cavity, okay? Um, and when they breathe out, some of that will leave, but not all of it. So they're essentially getting greater and greater degree of pneumothorax. So the purpose of the plastic wrap or saran wrap is you want to leave, you take down three sides. You don't want to just, you know, kind of wrap your entire body in plastic. Besides, you don't probably want to move their back in certain situations. Um, but put a plastic over, and take down three sides and leave one corner free. So as they breathe out, that's gonna allow some of that air to escape as they're increasing intrapleural uh, pressure and intraalveolar pressure. Then when they breathe back in, that's gonna suck that plastic surface back onto the skin and prevent more air from being pulled in, okay? Again, this is one of those situations where I've never had anybody email me and say, hey, I came across an accident and I had this stuff in my car. But I've actually doubled, I used to just give two points. Um, but I've cut out some of the other extra credit. So um, four points added to your extra credit list if you'll let me know by or on the day that we have our next lab exam. That you have this, if you ride your bike, you get in your bike baggie you or something like that, okay? Yes? Like, no, you don't have to take a picture. I'll, I'll take a statement from you that it's on honor system kind of thing. So what needs to be in it? Uh, saran wrap or some type of plastic wrap and you know the bandage tape um, that would adhere to the skin. Okay. All right, so now let's look at pulmonary volume. <laughs> And this will be part of our activity on Thursday. That term spirometer refers to that little apparatus down in the lower left hand <coughs> as you look at the screen. And we'll be measuring lung volume, okay, pulmonary function tests and lung volumes. So this is used to measure the degree of ventilation. Remember, we're still talking about pulmonary ventilation. So this is used to measure the degree and ability with which a 
an individual can ventilate their lungs. Move air in and out. Some of it is just volume related, and some of it is uh, time related. So, if someone is breathing in, that usually occurs over a shorter period of time, approximately two seconds. And then normal expiration takes a little bit longer, approximately three seconds. Okay, we'll talk about that when we talk about control of respiration. You breathe in, you breathe out, you breathe in, you breathe out. Like the tide coming in and out. So this volume, the volume that you breathe in or breathe out, not the sum of the two, you should breathe out the same amount that you breathe in over time. All right, it's identified as tidal volume. And it's approximately 500 mils or half a liter. Now you'll notice that this will be a problem when you do lab on Thursday because I asked for you to measure your tidal volume. And we have these dry spirometers. They're called dry. We used to do wet ones in which the, you would breathe. They would pass through a container of water and fill up under an <coughs> upside down box and would raise it. Well, anytime you have people breathing and moisture and all of that, you have potential for um, bacterial and mold growth. And so we got tired of sterilizing those and we went to these. With, uh, we'll use alcohol and swabs and these disposable mouthpieces. And so this you can only breathe into, all right? It won't measure expiration. So to measure inspiration, and we'll go over the directions again on Thursday, it's set up to six, uh, actually not marks, but to seven liters. Each small mark is 100 mils. And so if I'm going to breathe out, measure expiration, not inspiration. If I'm going to breathe out 500 mils, that's not going to show here, all right? So to get it to show, I'm going to move it over to a thousand mark, and then I'll just subtract a thousand from my answer. Now, is breathing a voluntary or an involuntary motor component? Voluntary. voluntary. It's a reflex, all right. So you don't have to think about it, but it's skeletal muscles. Those muscles that we talked about for the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles and the abdominal muscles are skeletal muscles. So I can take a deeper breath or a shallow breath um, or stop breathing at all, period, for a few seconds, up to a few minutes. I think the maximum is almost eight minutes by um, deep divers, free divers. I certainly, I think I can do about 40 seconds. Um, but the reflex, I don't have to be awake to breathe. So when I'm asleep, I'll continue to breathe. And that's the reflex that we'll talk about, the controls breathing, all right? But it's a reflex involving skeletal voluntary neurons. It's voluntary neurons that innervate our muscles of breathing. I've always heard it's like that's always a controversial thing. Is it okay to hold in your breath for a while, or is it like not healthy? That's okay. Because the drive to breathe will eventually overcome that. Now, I'll, most of you probably noticed if you've tried to hold your breath that it's easier to hold your breath for a prolonged period if you actually let some of the carbon dioxide that's building out out to kind of let it escape or if you're underwater to bubble out. What's not safe is to try to do activities to hold your breath longer. In other words, as we'll see when we do control of respiration, um, there's kind of a, similar to the RSA node, there's a circuit where the neurons depolarize normally for this two to three seconds. But as your oxygen needs change based on the amount of oxygen, CO2, hydrogen ions in the blood, that reflex can, tr can be triggered to change the rate of your respiration. So if you breathe off CO2, <sighs> rapid, deep breathing, things are going to start to go a little gray, all right, because you're breathing off O2, but you're not stimulated to breathe in carbon, your, um, um, oxygen because your CO2 levels fall. So then you decide to go into the water and try to hold your breath as long as possible and you'll faint because of the lack of oxygen. When you finally come to, you won't be conscious, but that drive to take a breath will come into effect as CO2 builds up into your body, in your body, and you'll be reflexively stimulated to take in a breath, but if you're underwater, you're unconscious, what you do is you, water pressure pushes it, water into your lungs, okay? 
So if you're on the ground, then you know it just depends on the safety of painting. So when my dad was in college, the some of his friends were trying to advertise a local, um, I don't know if it was a medical club or a ROTC type of uh, unit that was medical cadets, and so they asked him to paint during the college hour, and so he agreed. The only problem was he'd been playing soccer, and one of his teammates, one of his friends, who happened to be sitting next to him during college hour, had given him a pretty hard hit. So he started hyperventilating during the speaker and just fainted and slid right off the seat. And of course, the club members came over and you know pretended to revive him, take care of him. And his poor teammate thought that he had really done some serious damage to my dad's brain. <laughs> and he wasn't very happy to find out afterwards it was all a hoax. But that's the main problem. Not, you're not going to be able to really damage by um, trying to hold your breath. It's not your, your lungs aren't going to rupture because if you have other reflexes that prevent them from overstretching. But not just the lungs, but like if the CO2 keeps going and going. Your reflex will take, take over and not allow you to, to hold that in. All right, so problem with measuring tidal volume, because this is a, what this, was lead, this discussion was leading up to, is because this is voluntary, and you start thinking about what you're breathing, you're going to you know, take a smaller or a larger breath than you might normally because you're actually thinking about it. So it's hard to go, oh, okay, well, what's my normal breath? I don't normally think about whether I'm taking a breath or not. So you might have to do this a few times. And obviously that number 500 is based on people's unconscious, you know, they're on a machine and they're busy doing something else and they're not thinking about it. And that kind of comes out to the population average. So that was 200. All right. It felt like I could take a huge breath or a small breath. So breathe out while I can. You're not forcing it out, okay? That didn't move at all. I know I put air in there. So um, this morning I went from 150 to 400 because my mouthpiece was cracked. So let me try actually our cardboard mouthpieces instead of the plastic one. That might work better. So you're breathing out only? No, for not for, you don't want to take a deep breath because it's supposed to be tidal line. So we don't want to take a deep breath yet. For one of these measurements we will, but not for tidal volume. Tidal volume is a normal breath and a normal passive expiration so that you're not forcing air out. That was 500. So we'll have to use these cardboard pieces. They work better at the morning class. All right? Actually, 600. Okay, so you want to do it a few times and then kind of get, a, get an average for it. So now, that's tidal volume. All right? So now, if I take in as deep a breath as I can, the difference between my normal tidal volume intake and that is called inspiratory reserve. So then if I'm actually working out or climbing a mountain or whatever, I have a great expanse that I don't normally use. Kind of like a stroke volume for our, for our heart, okay? And this can range anywhere from 2,000 to 3,000 on average, depending on your exercise or gender. Now we breathe that out. We breathe in and out a few more times. And now we're going to force, this is where we breathe out passively, now we're going to force as much air out as possible. Okay, so this is where we use active expiration. And this is called my expiratory reserve volume. If I combine all three of those, known as vital capacity. So vital capacity is the sum of inspiratory reserve volume plus tidal volume plus expiratory reserve volume. 
So on Thursday when you do this lab, notice only two of these are expiratory. The inspiratory you can't measure with this machine. We don't suck into it. All right, so on Thursday when you do this lab, you're going to take your measured vital capacity and subtract from it your tidal volume, and that will give you, sorry, subtract from it the sum of your tidal volume and expiratory reserve volume, and that will give you your inspiratory <coughs> reserve. All right, so obviously if your tidal volume is huge, your tidal volume is 1,200 mils, then your inspiratory reserve volume is going to be smaller. Okay. Or if your measured tidal volume is only 200 mils, then your inspiratory volume will be relatively larger. Okay? So I'll illustrate this in just a moment. Expiratory reserve volume tends to be about 1,000 mils. And again, that's going to vary. These will be variable. Now, published average vital capacity. Since I was a senior in high school, every book and I mean, physiology book since then has published this as 4,800 mils. Okay, well, let's take a look. My tidal volume, I hit 600. Okay, now let's measure my um, vital capacity. <sighs> Always helps to stand on your tiptoes for some reason. Hit, I think about 2,000 this morning. It's supposed to be about 3,200 based on my height and age. <coughs> oh my goodness. Look at that. I think I must have started too high. 3,100. I must have forgotten to move it back to zero. So that was way more than it was this morning. So let me move it back to zero and we'll try that again. If you have these machines you can buy that increase your pulmonary function by resistance. You can blow against a resistant structure that strengthen your muscles. wrong with that. That came out to 1,200. <laughs> oh well. Nowhere near 4,800. Okay. So I can, I, how would I do just expiratory reserve? We'll take the 1,200 here. So 1,200 minus my 600 plus expiratory reserve. After passive expiration, it doesn't matter how deep a breath I take, Breathe out until it feels comfortable. I'm not using any abdominal muscles. I'm not using my internal intercostal muscles. All right, just until it feels comfortable, then put, it, put this in your mouth and try to force the rest of the air out. Whoops, I gotta reset it. Don't wanna cheat here. That was about 500. All right. That doesn't make any sense. But anyway, we'll put that up there. So that means my inspiratory reserve was about 100. Numbers are way off here. That's why you do this several times to get the feel of it. All right? <clears throat> now, back up to this 4,800. It varies dependent on whether or not you are male or female, whether you're African American or East Indian female. But this is just based kind of on an average without, of just gender, without race. One side is male, one side is female, okay? And it's based on height. So, anybody have a calculator? Because it's done in centimeters. I'm trying to remember the highest. Anybody have a calculator? Okay, 1.94 divided by 2.54. I mean, it's not 1 point, 194 divided by 2.54. Okay, so that's 76, that's five, uh, 6 feet 4, okay? 72 inches would be 6 feet. So the youngest age is 16, and the tallest person is 6 foot 4. So a female who is 16 and 6 foot 4, her expected vital capacity, maximum airflow, is 3,920, 3,920, all right? 
not even cracking 4,000. And then that number gets smaller as she gets older. So a uh, 74-year-old, six-foot-four woman, her vital capacity is 2,800, 2,795. No number in here even gets to 4,800, all right? Now aerobic activity, swimmers, usually have huge pulmonary volumes and vital capacities, okay? So no female here even passes 4,000, much less gets to 4,800. For the male, First time we see 4,800, what's 186 divided by 2.54? 11? 11? Um, 186 divided by 2.54, 2.54 centimeters in an inch. 0.38, huh? 0.3? No, 186 divided by 2.54. Okay, so just six foot one. So a six foot one male who is 16 is expected to have a vital capacity of 4,800. All right? By the time he gets to be 24, he has to be six foot four to have that expected vital capacity. So in other words, only the males covered by my finger, fingers in this upper corner are expected to have a vital capacity of 4,800. None of the females, and none of these males who are 16 and shorter than six feet, all right, but, uh, or older, are expected to have a vital capacity of 4,800. And yet the published expected vital capacity for the average population, so for the last 30 years, 38 years, has been 4,800. When I get retired, I have to research this number and figure out, I think it's a bunch of six foot Coast Guard <laughs> wannabes that they study to get this number. Is it nobody? I mean, I've had a few swimmers who've had hit 6,000. I've had some 5,000s and 6,000s. But it's not the average, that's for sure. So I have, I, I, I nobody in the last, you know, nobody seems to question this number. It's like, how many classes do this activity? Nobody questions the number, okay? So I have no idea what, where they, where it comes from, except some Coast Guard components. So those are, we'll look at those values. Now there's one additional volume, because obviously when you force all that air out of your body, out of your lungs, you haven't completely collapsed your lungs. All right, the alveoli are not sticking to each other. So there's still another 1,200 mils or so as residual volume. I'm not going to ask you for these numbers. You don't have to remember which one is 1,200, which one is 3,000, and which one is whatever, because obviously they're going to be different for different people, and I don't trust that number. But you should be able to identify the names of the volumes and what they mean and how they're determined. Okay. There is another, so these are volumes, and then we have function tests. And one function test is done by taking in as much air as you can and basically testing your vital capacity, all right? But trying to blow that air out as rapidly as you can. So what are we testing here? All right, if you have a narrowed airway, are you gonna blow out as rap air as rapidly as if you had a large diameter airway? No, all right? Vital capacity is measuring the overall volume of your lungs. So if you have a decreased vital capacity, that's involved in, in conditions such as um, pneumonia, where you have fluid in your alveoli, or pulmonary edema, or maybe uh, bronchial cancer or tuberculosis, where you've got a um, blockage, and that part of the lung maybe has collapsed because airflow can't get into it. So you're gonna have a decreased overall um, lung volume. If you have a narrowed airway, then it's gonna take you a long time to blow that air out, but not necessarily decrease your lung volume. In fact, in emphysema, you might have a greater lung volume, all right, as you tear down some of the alveolar walls, less surface exchange area, but greater volume. So, let's say that um, 
we're blowing out of this machine and it's marked to measure liters of air. So one, two, three, four, five. And it's marked to measure time. So this is moving along at a set rate and these will be seconds. So one second, two seconds, three seconds. And I put the tube in my mouth, close my nose off of the clip or hold it, and turn the machine on so that the paper is rotating at this rate. And then when I blow air, there's a stylus that marks on that. So if I were to just breathe in and out, the stylus would go up and down, okay? But now I'm gonna do a test in which I measure my forced vital capacity, which should be the same volume as my normal vital capacity, known as FVC. And I'm also going to be measuring my forced expiratory volume, which is known as FEV. Right? If I measure it at one second, then it's called FEV1. If I measure it at two seconds, it's FEV2. And when I'm done, I'm going to take a ratio of my forced expiratory volume at one second, the volume that I can get rid of in one second, divided by the total volume of air that I blew out, my forced vital capacity. Okay? So when I blow that air out, notice that as I'm blowing it out, the volume is increasing. Okay? So that stylus starts to move as the paper is moving. And then that's the maximum air I can blow out. Finally, I quit and take a breath. Right. So the maximum air I blew out was slightly over four liters. Now, how much of that did I blow out in one second? So we extrapolate. And at one second, I was at about 3.6. So if you have your calculator again, what's 3.6 divided by four? Alright, so 90% is my FEV1 ratio. Okay. It means 90% of my vital capacity I was able to blow out in one second. Now, let's do this with someone who has emphysema or maybe is an acute case of asthma. Notice that they eventually reached four liters. So their vital capacity was normal. I've exaggerated this a little bit. They blew out 2.3. So what's 2.3 divided by four? There will be an acute case of asthma here. Okay, so their FEV1 ratio would be how much? 57? 57. Depending on where you read, normal, FV1 ratio is 80 greater than 80 to 84 percent. Some books will say 80 percent, some books will say 84 percent. So our first person over here had a great FV1 ratio. This person, even though their vital capacity ended up being normal, all right, four liters is not bad for a vital capacity. It took them forever to actually get rid of all that air. Okay. So this is a standard classic test to differentiate between individuals who have either obstructive or restrictive pulmonary problems. So if you turn the page to the next, to the next page. We have these two classifications, and this is where we're going to stop today, okay? So, obstructive pulmonary disorders or restrictive pulmonary disorders. And it took me forever. I still don't like the term because they're not easily discerned. I think obstructive is really restrictive and whatever. But here's an image, okay, to help you. Obstructive, obstructive pulmonary disorders occur when the gas exchange surface area and volume is 
typically normal, but there is a very narrowed airway. Okay? So there's nothing wrong with the volume, but there's a narrow airway that, we, that obstructs airflow. See, I wanted to say restricts. That obstructs airflow. We see this type of a condition where you have a low FEV1 ratio, less than 80 to 84 percent, and an increased residual volume. Those are the two classic characteristics. Um, it's an increased residual volume. Why do you think there's an increased residual volume? Because of FEV1. They can't get all their air out. Okay. So that keeps increasing and spreading out, dilating the alveolar spaces and in emphysema, actually rupturing the alveolar walls. But there's typically a pretty normal vital capacity. Now when we look at a, um, restrictive, So restrictive pulmonary diseases have a normal airway, all right, but the gas exchange area is blocked. That's water I drew in there, okay? So it might be caused by pulmonary edema, pneumonia, tuberculosis in which the um, walled off area of infection has blocked gases from reaching the respiratory portion of the lungs, um, lung cancer, a collapsed lung, anything that's going to reduce lung volume. All right. So this is a decrease in lung volume and or surface area for gas exchange. With obstructive, there's a decrease in airway diameter. Resulting changes might also decrease surface area, all right? But there's usually an increase of normal lung volume. emphysema, we have additional loss of, of alveolar walls, so that has a decrease in surface area. It just depends on how long the emphysema has, has occurred. Right. So what are some examples of pathology? Asthma and COPD okay. are the most classic. So asthma, emphysema, or any other, emphysema is a form of COPD which stands for chronic obstructive, there's your word obstructive, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Okay. All, right. All right, so we'll stop there. We'll pick up um, alveolar ventilation on, just to keep the two classes together, on Thursday, I wanted to get to page 52, but just put the two classes together. Um, we'll do pick alveolar ventilation rates up and talk about gas exchange.